And first, we'll have Theo presenting his paper. All right, um, I guess I'm the non-auctions talk in here. Uh, but, uh, so this work is about kind of how to actually extend EI 15, uh, 1559 style base fees to the multi-dimensional resource setting. It's joint work with um, Alex Evans and Guillermo Angeris at Bain Capital Crypto and Tarun Chitra at Gauntlet. Um, and really what I want to convince you of is that fee markets with fixed relative prices, like what the gas market is in the EVM, are inefficient. And so what we're going to work through here is how to optimally set multidimensional fees. Um, and just kind of as a very silly example of this, like let's say we have a bunch of transactions. Some of them only uh, use CPU, like only use compute resources. Some of them only use bandwidth resources. Maybe these all cost one gas, but the CPU ones are more valuable as transactions than the bandwidth ones. So utility of like four and two respectively. And let's say we have a block and we can fit four of each type of transaction in this block. So we have four CPU slots, four bandwidth slots, and the gas price is three. So what ends up happening, we fill this with a bunch of CPU, but we don't put any of the bandwidth transactions in here because you know, we don't want negative utility. Um, however, if we had a multidimensional fee market where we could price the CPU and bandwidth resources um, separately, we could actually fill up this entire block. So in this way, like pricing orthogonal resources separately is going to allow us to increase throughput. And this is kind of the goal of what we want to do. Obviously, this is a toy example. Um, but you can imagine things like transfers and NFT mints consuming very different resources uh, on the full nodes. So um, I mentioned transactions, resources. Let's define this. Uh, we're going to start at a very abstract definition of a resource and just say that's anything that can be metered. So this could be things like blob data. Um, and so we're going towards two-dimensional fee markets right now. Uh, with rollups kind of um, increasing in usage a lot. It could be like big kind of categories, so anything that's compute, anything that's memory, anything that's storage, anything that's bandwidth. We could go all the way down to the individual opcodes and say there's actually a different unit of gas for every single opcode. We could actually go further down than that and talk about sequences of opcodes. So imagine if you have, if you're reading some slot of memory and you want to do that multiple times, the second time is going to be cheaper than the first time because it's already a hot slot. We could also say, you know, if we have, uh, if we want to parallelize execution, different uh, compute on different cores could be its own resource, and so on. So you can imagine this is very flexible. As long as we can say how much of this thing we're actually using, it can be a resource. And then we're going to formalize transactions um, as each transaction J is going to consume a vector of resources, a non-negative vector AJ. And so the ith entry of that vector is just the amount of resource I consumed by transaction J. We're going to introduce this vector x, um, which is going to record which of all possible transactions. So say we have n transactions in the mempool. xj is going to be 1 if that transaction j is included and 0 otherwise. And that allows us to write the quantity of resources consumed by a block very simply as just a times x, where a is this matrix where each column is going to be the resource vector for transaction j, and x is this 0, 1 binary vector that selects which of these we use, and, uh, or which is included in the block. All right, so what we can do is we want to say constrain and charge for each resource used. Um, so we're going to define a resource consumption target. So this is basically the amount of each resource we want in the block. Uh, in Ethereum, this is 15 million gas. And we can think of this as kind of the steady state of the blockchain system. So this is like kind of you know, the nominal resource usage we want. Um, we also have some type of resource limit. So this is going to be maybe like the burst capacity. So in Ethereum, this is 30 million gas. But you can imagine in a multidimensional setting, uh, this is going to be a vector instead of a scalar. Now we want to charge for every single resource that we consume. So we just introduce a price vector. And so P is going to have uh, a length of the number of different resources there are. And then each transaction, the cost is just simply uh, the dot product of P and the vector AJ, which is the resource usage of that particular transaction. OK, so we set this up. And the big question here is, like, how do we actually determine P? How do we determine these prices for each resource? And there's a few things that we probably want out of any reasonable pricing mechanism. Um, well, first, if our consumption of resource i, so axi, the ith entry of that, is equal to our target. So remember, the target is b star. Um, so b star, the ith entry of that. We don't want an update. That means that essentially we set prices correctly, because people are using the amount that we want them to use. 
On the other hand, if um, the amount of resource that's being consumed is more than the target, we probably want to increase the price because we're charging too little, and vice versa. If it's under the target, we probably want to decrease the price. And there's a lot of pricing mechanisms that actually satisfy this. Uh, one thing that was proposed recently, and so this is being used in 4844, uh, which is the blob data EIP, and this is also what was proposed in a Vitalik blog post on multidimensional resource pricing, is to use this exponential, um, this kind of multiplicative update rule. And you can check, and this satisfies all these properties, um, but there's a lot of pricing update rules that actually satisfy all these properties. So the question is, how do we choose among like all the pricing update rules if we you know, go with this one or if we go with something else. Um, in other words, is this a good update rule or not? And like, what does good even mean? And so the next part of this talk is we're going to show that all these pricing update rules are actually implicitly solving an optimization problem. And so if we choose a specific objective function as the network designer for this optimization problem, that leads us to a specific update rule. So we can say whether something's good or not based on you know, does this objective function uh, correspond to kind of what we want out of the network. And um, we call this problem the resource allocation problem, which um, I'm going to introduce in the setting that the network designer is omniscient, determines the transactions in each block. This will be relaxed shortly, but just as a mental model to construct this, this is a helpful place to start out. So we're going to introduce a few components to allow us to construct this problem. The first one is a loss function. And the loss function is simply the network's unhappiness with the resource usage. Um, and you can imagine kind of very silly things like this. Uh, these obviously can be quite a bit more complicated. But as a simple example, we might say if we're on target, our loss is zero. And if we're off target, our loss is infinity. So we're very unhappy if we're off target. We're um, completely content if we're on target. You might also have something where you actually don't care if you're underutilizing the network. You only care if you're overutilizing the network. So the same thing, except now if we're underutilizing resources, uh, we also have zero loss. Um, but whereas if we're overutilizing any of the resources, uh, we have infinity loss. So, and you can imagine you can get very complicated with uh, modeling interactions between different resources in this loss function as well. Um, the next thing we need is we need some way to talk about the set of allowable transactions. So before I introduce the network constraint that there's some like maximum burst capacity, um, but we can also have things like interactions among transactions as well. For instance, if there's a liquidation, only one transaction that is going for that liquidation can actually, uh, can actually you know, liquidate an under collateralized loan. Um, and we're going to capture all of these in some set S, which is just a subset of 0, 1 to the n. Um, and this can be quite complicated. We're going to play a little bit of a mathematical sleight of hand here, where for the time being, we are going to consider the convex hull of S. So all this means is that we you know, take this from 0, 1 to the n. We kind of fill in the entire thing. Uh, as a consequence, we can have things like fractional transactions being included. And if we say have xj is equal to 1 half, you can roughly think of that as you know, that transaction j will be included in one of the next two blocks. So you can think of it as a probability that it's in you know, the next block j. Um, and we'll see that we can relax this in a bit. Finally, the last component that we want is we want some notion of utility. Um, here, I am going to group together uh, and talk about the transaction producers, which is essentially everybody that's interacting with the blockchain. So what we're modeling here is the interaction between like the blockchain or kind of the network designer and everyone that is using the network. Um, I think there's other talks in this session that will, you know, there's obviously a lot of complexity there that we're sweeping under the rug. And so other talks in this session will kind of break out these components and really go into that. Um, but for now, you can think of this as something between the network and the people that are using the network. Um, and so these transaction producers from a transaction are going to get a joint utility, QJ. So again, this is the users and the validators all together. And um, of course, we almost never know Q in practice, but we'll see that the network does not actually need to know what these utilities are. As long as we assume that you know, these, these exist and someone knows them or they can be elicited by some mechanism, we're going to do OK. Putting all these together, uh, we can write the resource allocation problem quite simply, and that's just going to be maximize the utility of included transactions minus the loss incurred by the network, um, subject to the constraint that y is going to be the resource usage of the included transactions, and these transactions are in the convex hall of the set of allowable transactions, which again can be really complex or hard to solve. Um, of course, 
we can't actually solve this in practice because the network designer doesn't include what or doesn't decide which transactions are in a block. The block builders do that. Um, the network designer doesn't actually know what the utilities are. And of course, we can include fractional transactions. So kind of, you know, we have all these problems. Um, fortunately, we are going to be able to look at the dual of this and kind of pull from like very classical techniques in convex duality theory to decouple this problem to something that's actually tractable to solve um, kind of in a live system. At a very high level, what we're going to do is we're going to take the constraints and relax them to penalties. Um, and so just kind of to give some intuition, the network designer only cares about the resource utilization why. So the network designer only cares about what transactions are included uh, insofar as they imply a particular resource utilization. Of course, block builders, users, transaction producers, et cetera, care about what transactions they can actually include because that determines their own PNL. Um, so we're going to decouple the utilization of the network and that of transaction producers. And for that, um, we're going to essentially introduce some penalty for violating this constraint, which will be related to prices. Um, of course, standard results show that you know if we set this penalty correctly, the dual problem has an optimal value that's equal to the original problem, and these utilizations are equal. OK, so the dual problem is going to be to find the prices p, or penalties, that minimize some dual function g of p. Um, these prices can be thought of as penalties for violating this constraint that the resource utilization uh, of the loss of the network is equal to kind of what's actually in the block. And um, this problem is separable, so g of p actually has a really nice interpretation. I'm not going to go through the derivation, but essentially you have two terms. One is this conjugate function of the loss L. Um, this is something that's very easy to evaluate uh, for the network itself. It's usually simple, usually closed form. Um, and so this, that is kind of the network term. And then the next term is the supremum, um, which we're going to look at a little bit more closely. Um, so kind of we write that out as an optimization problem. And it's pretty clearly exactly the problem solved by block builders. So it's to maximize the net utility or to choose the transactions that maximize the net utility subject to them being in the set of allowable transactions. And one thing here that we actually can do is we can replace the convex hall of S um, with just S itself, because this is a you know, LP, or a, sorry, a linear program. Um, these two are going to have the same optimal value. So once we get to this point, we actually can ignore that convex hall constraint. Um, and then because this is the exact problem solved by the block producers and determining what transactions go into a block, the network can just observe x star, which is the transactions included, and in, say the previous block or some, you know, some set of previous blocks. So the network actually never has to solve this you know, difficult, uh, hard optimization problem. Um, and what do we end up getting at optimality? So like, let's assume that we have the correct prices, p star. Um, then the optimal, you know, the optimal solution to the block building problem, given these prices, is going to be x star. And if we write out the optimality conditions, which is just first order conditions, um, we get that the utility, or sorry, the um, utilization of the network, y star, is exactly equal to ax star. And so y is going to satisfy this, um, because it comes out of the conjugate function, it's going to satisfy this, uh, the gradient of the loss evaluated at y star is going to be equal to the optimal prices p. If we dive into what that means, um, replacing kind of y star with ax star, we can interpret this as the prices that minimize g charge the transaction producers exactly the marginal cost faced by the network. So in other, way, uh, or in other words, if we solve this optimization problem or if we correctly set the prices, the network um, is charging exactly the marginal uh, cost uh, for resource utilization which is kind of a good thing. This is what we would want out of this problem. Um, additionally, these prices are going to incentivize transaction producers to include transactions that maximize the welfare generated uh, minus the loss incurred by the network. How to actually elicit these utilities um, is something that I think some of the other talks are going to go into. But we're going to assume that we can do this for now. So in terms of how do we actually do this, I said this is what you get at optimality. Well, that's great, but like, how do you actually minimize this? Um, well, we can compute the gradient. The first term is easy um, because the network can determine y star. So this is kind of something that we just get from standard results and convex optimization. Um, and then the network can observe x star based on what the transaction producers include in the last block. So this is the block building problem solution. And you could just read this off. Then we have the gradient, 
of the dual function and we can apply whatever your favorite uh, gradient based optimization algorithm is. So maybe gradient descent, you can you know, play around with the parameters here, you could use momentum, depending on kind of what you want the dynamic behavior of, this, um, of the prices to be. And we can look back at some of these simple cases uh, if we have that loss function that I showed you earlier on the right, um, where we have you know, just zero loss if we're exactly on target, infinity loss otherwise. We get a price update rule where essentially we're updating the prices with the residual. So B star minus AX star, you can think of as the residual of how far off we are in resource utilization. If we don't care if we are under utilizing the network, we force the prices to be non-negative. And this makes sense, right? Because if we care if we're under utilizing, we might want to actually um, make the price, or we might want to make the prices negative to subsidize resource usage. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into what I introduced earlier, but see our paper if you want to know about that one. Um, and I'm gonna skip that just for sake of time, but uh, essentially. The moral of this is that choosing the objective function of the, uh, by the network designer is going to, you know, you turn the crank with this method and you get kind of an optimal price update rule based on that particular objective function. So it makes more sense to start with the optimization problem than to start with a particular price update rule uh, that's ad hoc and try to back analyze it into figuring out what the behavior of it actually is. Um, there's a number of extensions of this. You can do like per contract throughput, um, obviously, there's a lot of empirics that should be done here, and there's some implementations by the Avalanche and Penumbra teams, so really excited to see those and kind of what the um, empirical behavior of this looks like. And then the scheme is actually optimal in a certain sense, where you can borrow from kind of online convex optimization results and show that you have, this is essentially a zero regret on average scheme. And I'm, I'm Happy to talk about that more during questions or offline. Um, but I do want to mention that this is stronger than a lot of the traditional game theoretic results in that the zero regret results don't require the adversary to be rational. We only need a bounded adversary, and we don't need to play to any type of equilibrium. Uh, and yeah, for more info, check out our paper. Thank you. So any questions? So is it correct to understand that instead of choosing gas prices, you're just choosing your like B star then in this situation? Uh, I, well, I guess. Or like your loss function or some other kind of. More or less, yeah. Because like even in, uh, if you think about like for EIP 1559 even, they're essentially only choosing kind of, I mean, they're choosing the update rule, but in some sense that falls out of a particular objective function. Mm -hmm. But what they are doing is they're saying that, you know, uh, one addition is worth the same, or, or sorry, I guess like one S read is worth the same as like 800 additions or something like that. So they're fixing these relative prices of the resources. Um, and so if you go from one dimensional fee markets to multi-dimensional fee markets, you go from kind of like having everything being this fixed uh, relative prices that all move with each other. So it's like every time you went to the grocery store, if like meat was priced in terms of like, I don't know, gallons of milk, yeah. um, to decoupling those and saying that these things can float independently. And so this is, you know, I'm not saying what to choose as those. You could be coarse, you could be granular, um, but it's saying to kind of decouple those. Uh, but I guess it's also saying, like, here's a principled way of starting at a loss function and then going to the price update rule. I see. And then you, like, build up a generalization of that and you can, yeah. Right. Cool. It's great stuff. Um, when uh, I was one of the people that was playing around with one of the implementations, but um, when you're discussing um, some notion of optimality across fee mechanisms, do you believe that, um, like over the you know coming coming changes to blockchains and evolutions of them, that they'll all end up being some derivative of like this multi-dimensional approach, or do you think there's like more of this kind of fee design pay, design space to explore? Um, I think in terms of like the base, so there, there's, e even with this, like this is just a start, right? Like in terms of, we didn't really look into what the actual, you know, beyond gradient descent, like what the actual algorithms there are that make sense. Uh, you might want to have some things um, 
be able to adjust quicker than others. Uh, as an example, we also, one thing here is we don't really like look into cumulative type resources like storage. So in some ways, like this is uh, mostly the mental model for this is like ephemeral stuff. So like compute, bandwidth, things that kind of, you know, what you did 100 blocks ago doesn't really affect the block right now. So there's a number of things that fit into this framework that extend it, but I would imagine base fees are kind of going to go with this. This is not like, I, I mean, a lot of these results look very similar to very classic economics uh, work, which so um, these, these ideas have been around for a while. I would say we just kind of applied it to the blockchain sense and did it in a way that allows us to separate out the block builders from the network itself. Um, but uh, so I'd imagine from the base fee perspective, things are going to kind of move towards this way. Um, obviously, uh, once you start talking about the tip mechanism, MEV, et cetera, there's a lot more. Um, this is more focused on just kind of the network throughput itself. So how do you optimally kind of um, run a full node, let's say. But yeah, and a lot of the classic economics literature is really interesting to read. So if you've read a little bit of it, this should look familiar. If you've read too much of it, I would read Red Plenty as to like why some of this stuff doesn't work out. Okay, thank you, Theo. Yeah. And